Um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, we will start. Um, welcome to our third and the last talk of our Feral Palace lecture series. Uh, we're live streaming this time from our Crater underground office because we have a bit of a rain problems on the site. And slowly, because of that, also everything is coming to life. Uh, young shots of Japanese knotweed are ready to be harvested and boost us and boost our uh, immune systems uh, so we can get ready for um, our mentorship sessions in May. This is also the last week of our open call. The deadline for the applications is this Friday on 22nd of April, also the Earth Day. Um, so there are three days left for you to apply and work with our dear mentors, the pioneers of emerging fields of architecture and urbanism, Klaas Koitenbrauer, Deborah Solomon and Druk Kranz. Uh, if you're an individual considering to work on Krater's multi-species futures, you're welcome to join in as well. So if you don't have the team, please do apply and we will try to make sure to connect you with other interested um, applicants and boost new collaborations and connections once we receive your applications. Um, worth mentioning also that the project is a part of a partnership network platform of the Center of Creativity here in Ljubljana, co-financed by the European Union and also by the Republic of Slovenia. So thank you for that. And what is awaiting for us today? Uh, we will start uh, the session with Danica's short introduction into perspectives through which the Krater site is currently understood in media and also in the architectural plant, plants. Uh, her analysis will point out the problems with understand, understanding Krater as an abandoned site or as an empty plot and will serve as an invitation for more accurate ways of perceiving and acting upon rewilded urban sites in the future. Um, and after Danica, uh, we will be joined with our dear colleague Ruk Kranz, a social ecological transformations researcher at the Institute for Ecology and a translator and editor at the Journal uh, for the Critique critic of science. Internationally, he is affiliated with the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, Participatory Futures Global Swarm, and the Shared Futures Project. He is also the founder of Futurescraft, a research and design studio for experimental futures, generative games, and other forms of engaging with post-capitalist economies. In his talk, entitled Governing More Than Human Transformations, Rook will explore both the meanings and designerly implications of more than human commoners, economies, transitions, and governance. We really uh, find Rook's work important as he will break down the theory behind the post-humanist perspectives, take us through the very basic vocabulary and examples. Um, he will offer us new conceptual frameworks and arguments to move away from the anthropocentric ways of governing and planning our future cities. Uh, and without further ado, Ruk um, and Danica, please. Um, Thank you, Gaia. The word is yours. Um, and again, we, we actually pre-recorded the, um, the lecture of Danica in case we would have some struggles. So we'll just play, play it out for you now. Hey, so as some of you may know, uh, the place of our collective investigation is Krater, which uh, was abandoned construction pit really long time ago. Uh, this photo was taken in July 2021 at the very end of uh, the last summer school program. Um, I think that most of us <laughs> would agree uh, that what we see here is park or urban nature, some kind of park. Um, but if we pass through the uh, media cover um, or how the media wrote about uh, the crater site, uh, it might not be so obvious. So this is a Slovenian magazine Finance, and they um, explained um, like this. We checked for how long we'll have to watch this disgrace or why the state always chronically short of money is not selling one of Ljubljana's best lands at a time when real estate prices are at record heights. So the next one, the vacant state owned land causing damage. 
than the next one. The area of the Bezhigre Dvor was cleared of weeds and rats. And again, the Nevnik, Bezhigrad's crater, a construction pit forgotten by the state and the people. So what is actually obvious here, that this course treats a plot of land only in its capacity to produce profit. Hence, for quite some time, the place has been nothing but a poor investment defined in the media by a cost of land and its maintenance and possible investments. Uh, the crater was somehow rejected as a leftover space because be, before collective um, Traina and other collectives joined it. And actually, media uh, was causing, uh, with its writing, some kind of a public trauma, uh, being completely unable, unable to see uh, what is actually happening um, at the site. And it is especially bizarre when we pair these statements from the articles with the actual photographs. So Finanza, again, it is from 2019, but doesn't matter. For a quarter of a century, there has been a hole in the area of the former artillery barracks, one of the best locations in Ljubljana. Why? For how long we will have to be exposed to it? And yeah, you can see Gaia here in, in some, some kind of Arcadia environment. Um, so these are some of the keywords used um, in the media uh, coverage before um, the collective Trine and other collectives joined. Um, my favorite is that uh, residents of the nearby blocks are deli delighted by a tractor and an excavator which were cleaning overgrown uh, vegetation. Uh, why media is so stubborn here to name uh, it a construction site when it's so obvious from the photographs uh, that also they are using uh, that it's not a construction site. Um, its current state is actually, um, if it is a construction site, it occurs by the spontaneous formation of feral ecosystems. Um, but even if some text exposes that it's actually a park there, not a construction site, uh, they always use it in a manner that the park is a temporary, uh, only a step uh, on a way to uh, paved or build over the area. So media treats uh, the area as a problem that threatens otherwise um, moderately regulated city and it's absolutely a burden to its inhabitants. Uh, incompleteness is a status that is treated negatively in spatial planning and as an anomaly that needs to be annulled by injecting a controlled program and regulating ownership structures. Uh, we actually consider this incompleteness to be a um, state of abandoned and neglected site and very bad. Um, so if you go further, then it's not actually a surprise. Um, how the architectural competition for the Palace of Justice pitted this patch of land. Uh, of course, we have this universal floor plan drawings, uh, but what this special floor plan is telling us is actually um, that um, it's a tabula rasa. Um, and uh, if media is... Uh, stating this unfinished construction site waiting to be repaired by the injection of the program. Uh, this floor plan um, gives us a tabula rasa without history, without context, and uh, we see the plot which is only limited by its ownership. Um, and both media and this drawing implies that intervention is not only needed but necessary. Uh, first, as a correction measure, so we are going to correct this uh, construction site. And the other one, when we see this uh, um, empty plot of land, uh, we could intervene freely into it. Um, and now, you know, because we already introduced some uh, pictures from the crater, uh, it is not hard to spot that there is something fundamentally missing from the abstract floor plan. Um, when one compares it, and especially when one compares it with the aerial uh, view of the plot. Um, what is absent from the drawing, which serves as a base for uh, the planning of uh, the new Palace of Justice, are actually inhabitants that are already at the location, pioneering species, um, and their interconnectedness to the 
much wider area of um, Ljubljana uh, green spaces, uh, all that function of nature and life, we are not really used to recognize because we are not directly exposed to it um, daily. And what is actually most provoking here to ask is, uh, <laughs> What is it that Krater sets behind the visible in this conflict position? And maybe uh, this is this unpre unpredictability that is inherent to nature. Uh, and why is it important to work on changing the negative images and connotations associated with abandoned spaces um, by understanding this abandonment and the complex, very complex incompleteness of a site? Um, as we saw from this short analysis, it is not self-evident uh, to expose biodiversity and the potential for coexistence of species when general narratives only expose degraded space. Uh, but the work of the Crater Collective reminds us that the coexistence of all living beings is an inevitable condition of all practices. Uh, with this position, they opened up a supportive environment for other artists to create alternatives right within the real situation and over the generation pu pushed into an individualized precariat and alliance of collectivity. So to conclude on a positive note, um, I would like to show one other project. Um, it's from the artist Hans Hake who, when selected to create an artwork for Bundestag courtyard, invited all members of the Bund Bundestag to bring 100 kilos of soil from their election district to Berlin and deposit it around the title to the population. This title, of course, completely changed the meaning of the title, the other title, which is exposed at the entrance of the Bundestag, uh, which states to German people. Mm. And it is actually an untended habitat of growth that is not to be disturbed. Uh, I think it's a really nice example of multi-species coexistence, of cultivating multi-species coexistence. And uh, from this short analysis, um, it might look like uh, that we are without the supporting framework which would allow us to see, understand, manage and live with the places such as Krater. But this is exactly the point why with Gaia we choose to organize this school and invited the rock uh, class and Debra um, to set a background to, to reset thinking and to allow us to, to design, to understand design and to differently and to design for a different world. So uh, I would pass now a uh, word back to Gaia and rock. Great, we're back. Thank you, Danita, for your wonderful uh, presentation and inspi inspiring conclusion. And now I will just pass the, the word um, to Rook. And Rook, the floor is yours. Just a second. There you go. Um, also with your presentation, moving in and going out. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, I've in listened with great interest to what Klaus and Deborah have had to say about uh, their initiatives. Uh, and it's very much, yeah, all I think, um, building up uh, a lot of crucial knowledge that has been somewhat missing uh, in Slovenia. Um, and also as, you know, people of the global north who have somewhat you know, been been subject of of the enlightenment and all these you know uh, divides uh, in our minds and in our societies, um, and hopefully, yeah, with with these talks and the mentorship, we can really try uh, or, or really start making the interventions needed to to uh, change the system, or rather, to create the space for uh, yeah many alternatives to the system to coexist. Um, so as we discussed with Danica and Gaia, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to dedicate uh, at least part of this talk to a somewhat broader overview of, of what we might call post-humanism. Uh, that is one of the few 
good isms that are out there in academic discourse, uh, you could say, next to a few others that we will also uh, highlight. Um, but as this particular design call or design challenge is indeed geared towards architects, landscape architects, urban planners, uh, though the more interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary the teams, the better, of course, uh, we thought it would be helpful to have a closer look at uh, some of the theoretical foundations and the vocabulary of post-humanism, uh, which includes also, among other things, a disambiguation from transhumanism or, or yeah, similar uh, movements and, and not similar in, in any ways. And then its historical influences as well to situate it within a uh, broader and historical movements, including eco-feminist uh, and indigenous uh, resistant movements and ways of knowing. And then also to resituate it back into some contemporary relevant change movements, uh, visions and discourses, uh, specifically degrowth and the commons, uh, or rather see how these practices, ways of thinking do and can overlap um, and seeing as degrowth and the commons uh, say specifically are some of the more salient narratives around uh, change in the global north. And so hopefully this, uh, this deeper understanding will uh, contribute to design for and within these alternative paradigms, uh, because seeing their intersectionality and where they come from is uh, really important. Um, and yeah, how do we conceptualize the problems in the first place uh, that are then subject to a process of a, a design intervention or however. Um, and situating is uh, important. There, there's also, of course, a risk in kind of uh, post-human design, multi-species design uh, becoming, of course, we also see this somewhat uh, buzzwords in, in various design spaces, um, which are sometimes not very inclusive at all although sometimes play with interesting ideas, um, which is to say that, yeah, there, there are also problems uh, 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 broader than, you know, discussing the topic itself uh, that we're speaking about and, and how can our practices really be in line or embodied and even then aligned with uh, these other movements um, in such a way. And so if this per first part will be intended to give this overview, the second will then ask, uh, what are the theories and strategies of change that can inform our design practice uh, at multiple levels? Uh, so to change the current system or rather to nurture a space for alternatives, uh, we need to change our ways of thinking about change itself, uh, social, cultural, institutional, and the ways of nature cultures. Uh, going beyond these divides. Yeah, I could have probably. Um, and then we will, yeah, turning to theories of change, uh, then we will explore a bit more in depth of how can we conceptualize Traina and related movements around the world. And also this dimension of, you know, translocal connections between these movements around the world. How can we kind of conceptualize this as, as prefigurative practices and networks emerging? And how do these uh, like interplay with the state as this, you know, historical hegemonic institution, um, but which may, you know, as the state being in a specific place to actually put in place regulations and the whole judicial system that's of course attached to it that we're very interested in also of rights in terms of representing non-human interests and so forth in, in policy and legal frameworks. And then we will look at a specific kind of theory of change you could say, which is like changing the world through, yeah, ficting. Uh, so can, uh, yeah, new ways of telling stories uh, and new characters in those stories from new perspectives, non-human and more than human perspectives, uh, contribute to shifts in, in uh, yeah, mindsets, postures, and in the end, yeah, create the conditions for their own realization in, in some points, in, in some cases. 
Mm. And then we will look at one uh, particular model uh, of an intervention that's been played around. And indeed, also the ZOOP methodology uh, is a kind of a variation or, or a, 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 yeah, improvement or like, yeah, there are many experiments like this. And indeed, uh, ZOOP also tries to, uh, the ZOOP initiative tries to bring them together. Uh, but here we will look at specifically this notion of a parliament of things, what it might mean for uh, yeah, an interaction between different uh, yeah, scientists, artists, the wider public, and is it actually a viable like governance or decision-making framework, or will we need to think even deeper about uh, yeah, modes of representation, what that means for societal change? Um, and then we'll reflect on and hopefully also engage in an active discussion on, on, based on this, what kind of levels of intervention uh, we could identify for the Krater site. And so one of the kind of uh, starting frameworks that uh, might be useful here also generally for designers is the transition design framework uh, developed at Carnegie Mellon University School of Design, uh, which tries to go beyond this kind of, uh, as I was saying, fad of you know social innovation, and and uh, taking it one step further to really try to incorporate or rather design as said uh, for and within new paradigms, and really think through deeply what that means for for design practice. Uh, both on, in terms of, yeah, uh, visioning these alternatives that are possible, but don't, the actual steps that would make it possible, including various kinds of interventions at various levels. There are many theories of change at play that are that can work with each other here. So in the first part, let's say we will be guided by this kind of vision for transitions uh, on top and we will explore some theories of change and posture and mindset all along the way in terms of how we can reorient uh, design around non-human, more than human concerns, but also politics and decision-making and governance. So in terms of, yeah, uh, brief introductions to something that's such a broad, vast and rich kind of category as post-humanism, like I will uh, try to do uh, my best in, in brief. Um, but the essential idea is that, yeah, uh, there is, or one way to frame it as Rossi Bradotti does in her uh, yeah, book and throughout her, her work on, on post-humanism and the post-human convergence um, is that we are in a kind of unprecedented time uh, between the fourth industrial age and the sixth extinction, or rather the sixth extinction is in many ways already underway. Um, and yeah, uh, this has, you know, big consequences for, for yeah, who, who is the we today, who are the subjects uh, of change and who is the other uh, and, and these are the kinds of questions that are at the core. So uh, one, one influence would be a critique of humanism uh, and another line would be critiques of anthropocentric, anthropocentrism and these uh, obviously interlap um, in many ways, but uh, the core concern is like for non-humans and all uh, historically othered uh, being subjects, uh, women, indigenous people, uh, non-white peoples, and their ways of knowing and uh, their, yeah, uh, uh, resistance uh, uh, towards, uh, yeah, extractivist, uh, patriarchal, uh, capitalist institutions, um, and uh, disambiguation uh, might be in order with transhumanism, which. Uh, does have nuance in of itself as a emerging field, uh, but is very much also overwhelmed with a specific kind of transhumanism, uh, which uh, yeah could be summed with 
like uh, some masculinist uh, desires to uh, colonize Mars and to yeah microchip our brains and uh, things like this. Um, but so, yeah, the, the core question is like um, the interplay uh, of this, you know, a so-called post-human turn or how many uh, scholars of this field would, would call it. And, and it is being applied in many or uh, reshuffling many disciplines or, or uh, kind of settings of disciplines. Um, And to situate a little bit um, post-humanism and uh, historical developments, movements. Uh, yes, as said, uh, well, these are some useful references that you may find in exploring these topics further. Um, but uh, one key concept, as said, is like uh, this uh, process of othering that uh, capitalism is intrinsic to us. Um, and one way to call the, these others, uh, these reproductive labor that's not being accounted for in, in any yeah, uh, uh, capitalist imaginary would be this meta-industrial class. And, and these are also ways to rethink uh, Marxism itself, for example, um, like uh, the proverbial, yeah, uh, male factory worker is uh, kind of at the heart of some ideas uh, within there. And uh, for example, Ariel Saleh in Ecofeminism as Politics really affirms uh, the, the non human dimensions uh, uh, through also this uh, critique of uh, a Marxist thought. Um, and uh, at the same time, social ecology and deep ecology and related movements. And so situating uh, post-humanism within more contemporary uh, movements, uh, we would, yeah, one very relevant and salient in the global north, say, although also in uh, other areas would be the commons. Um, and it's quite tricky uh, to kind of offer a, a, a quick and easy version or a definition of the commons. Um, but uh, one of the foundational works on, on the current understanding of what a commons is, uh, is the work of Eleanor Ostrom's Governing the Commons, uh, where she was actually uh, kind of contesting an older paradigm by uh, set by Garrett Hardin um, around uh, how you know, common goods could be or not be managed successfully by by people in a self-managed way, um, which yeah, in turn was a kind of a precedence for for the neoliberal economy in, in a lot of ways. Uh, whereas Ostrom showed that in fact, uh, yeah, institutions beyond state and markets do and can exist and have existed in some examples for, for hundreds of years uh, where yeah, uh, community resources, natural resources could be managed collectively. Um, notions of polycentricity also imply here, whereas there is a kind of uh, like a situatedness of people who manage within local places, but also a kind of networked form of those uh, for uh, decision making. Um, but so uh, we can see that this definition also implies nature as a kind of other, right? It's uh, natural resources, um, plain and simple in this formulation. Um, and there are also, of course, other than interpretations of, of the commons, such as uh, uh, Moment. My screen just stopped here for a second. Of, sorry, of Hardin and Negri on, on the common. Um, but then there is a third uh, relational perspective influenced also by ecofeminism and political ecology, which is a deeply relational one. 
So whereas uh, the first one emphasizes the natural resources on which we all rely, uh, the second emphasizes the social capacities we have become increasingly central to contemporary forms of capitalist accumulation. Um, the third, uh, the commons, it says it's never just a resource or a social institution for managing resources. Uh, it's not land or knowledge or rules, but it's the way these and more are combined, used and cared for by and through a collective. And that's not only human, but also non-human. And Silvia Federici, for example, here argues that enclosure of the commons relies on an a priori separation of the social and natural spheres, the reproductive, uh, the productive and the reproductive. And the, the relegation, for example, of women's work, uh, like child rearing, childbirth, etc., to the domestic sphere outside of this productive economic sphere represents this naturalizing of this kind of labor, naturalizing the other. And so the urban commons is also a relevant contemporary discourse um, as it kind of uh, identifies the city as a locus, uh, as a significant locus of thinking about change today. Um, and yeah, it relates to, you know, urban public goods, as you could say, and it uh, very much yeah, relates to initiatives like you know, relocalization of food production, um, and food forests, uh, things like that. Uh, but it's well, much broader than that and also discusses, uh, you know, digital infrastructure and many things more. It's essentially a question of, uh, yeah, uh, property rights it's a question of uh, top down versus yeah other forms other possible forms of, of governance and management and here are some examples where uh, thinking about the urban commons and multi-species perspectives meet uh, in the last few years uh, you can find many journal articles or uh, books book chapters on the subject which I think can be very helpful in, in making those connections uh, and exploring further conceptually all these things. And then degrowth is another, or in, in some cases post-growth uh, termed, um, is also somewhat difficult to uh, define uh, in a quick way, but um, Essentially, it comes out of uh, a French movement or de croissants uh, meant as a kind of missile term that would cut at the heart or what what it's uh, those who who came up with it thought at the heart of of the problem today, which is a growth oriented economy and everything that comes with that. And there's a whole. Uh, history and genealogy behind the concept, but uh, essentially, um, and it's not, yeah, a coherent, you could say, framework or, or a theory of change even. There are many ideas about change within the movement and, and the scholarship, um, and it's a very much an active, uh, yeah, dialogue or ongoing process. Um, but at the same time, it is a somewhat, uh, a coherent uh, prognosis and a set of propositions ranging from universal basic income services and maximum income uh, to you know relocalization again and uh, focus on well-being economies uh, and instead of growth economies that also uh, imply this uh, turn towards uh, non-human concerns and essentially embedding them into the heart of, of what an economy means or re-embedding them rather as uh, oikos the the root for economy and ecology uh, meaning house uh, and uh, barbara muraka for example a degrowth uh, philosopher and theorist uh, talks about this a lot um, and also about uh, reappropriating for example the eco system services concept because as we know in a lot of mainstream like uh, uh, 
uh, both research and in policy making. Uh, nature is essentially, like many others uh, today, uh, instrumentalized. Um, but she argues that this ecosystem services could actually uh, be a way to rethink uh, like a radically different conception of ecosystem services could be a waypoint for many people to start thinking about uh, yeah multi-species uh, relations perspectives and politics and there's also the ongoing question of uh, decolonizing or resituating degrowth in the global north in relation to uh, the global south and um, essentially it's yeah for last uh, here degrowth is also not essentially living with less, although many times it's presented, you know, living with less, but it's foremost living differently. It's foregrounding, yeah, alternative possible economies, and it foregrounds alliances among alternatives and, and the possibilities of a pluriverse rising, which is where all of these perspectives again meet. These are... Um, uh, this is one example for uh, in the top right of a very useful book on these subjects. So what would more than human economies could mean in practice and what does this uh, change towards them as an open goal uh, mean? And on the other hand, we have some yeah contemporary artists um, on the lower end of the slide um, playing around with the idea of, of what a post-human or a more than human economy means. Like uh, on the bottom right, uh, we have uh, what is called an environmentalist stock exchange by, by an artist group, uh, Cream on Chrome. Um, it essentially plays with the idea and makes players aware that any small, uh, anything that you take away from the system has yeah reverberations throughout the whole system and your tasks basically with the impossible task of of uh, taking bits out uh, while trying to maintain balance mm. and on the other hand yeah I have server farm very interesting project that uh, plays with the idea of like a self-sustained more than human economy in some ways uh, it's actually um, based on yeah, a revitalization of a site uh, polluted by heavy metals. And the artist uses special plants that can extract these uh, heavy metals um, through a process of which I, I, I forgot the name of. But um, uh, this idea is it's in prototype form is uh, it's called biofarming metal as well. Um, Basically, it, it's not super efficient, but it's actually more just like a, a bonus point to, to the actual regeneration of the, of the soil that's going on. But the artist would use the metals extracted from the plants uh, to build circuitry or the hardwiring of different sensorics that could be used uh, to monitor the plants uh, for data that's not just human relevant but also non-human relevant and he also depicts this kind of circuit instead of a circuitry board you have different non-humans cooperating as as a computer or yeah in, in our case we could imagine as as an economy so these might be some influences uh on you um if you were to think more yeah indirect ways or ways to play with these ideas um that are conducive yeah, to, to uh, the public thinking through uh, these relations. And there's also a lot of yeah, cross-fertilization, you could say, going on in different narratives of new economies and, and what that means uh, from a multi-species perspective, uh, like what does a sharing circular regenerative economy or a smart city mean through a post-human lens? Uh, is something that's yeah widely debated uh, these days and again could be another influence um, on on the, the design interventions that you would go for 
um, some final notes on on these kind of interrelations between uh, yeah, post-humanism and contemporary movements situated in, in their history. Um, one has said, is this discursive contestation that is going on as yeah, designers, architects, many of you will have heard the you know buzzwords of sharing economies, uh, smart cities, what that means in terms of city architecture and new urbanisms and so forth. But it's it's worth pointing out that yeah there is deep discursive contestation going on here that these are shared let's say signifiers but uh, they do not mean the same thing for for different people with with different interests uh, yeah taking up different positions in society and so forth and so it's imperative to to think through our own position here as you know. Uh, essentially uh, white uh, middle class urbanites uh, to yeah design responsibly so another aspect of this is is situatedness so we might you know import uh, fancy buzzwords from abroad but they might not you know speak to anyone besides a close circle of, of elite uh, designers and so on uh, that threat is very much present um, all throughout and, and many times this happens so uh, it's definitely worth to consider um, how you can situate these movements these notions into local histories cultures traditions or so-called vernacular designs and yeah i'm also interested to converse with you and what that means in slovenia specifically as yeah uh, people who have undergone a, a specific kind of, of colonization, I suppose, of this kind of modernity um, and, and uh, uh, yeah, its specifics in history matter. And, and finally, uh, some concepts uh, which we will get back to towards the end of the presentation. Uh, one is a parliament of things uh, concept, yeah, coined by Bruno Latour which speaks to uh, this idea of how can uh, non-humans be represented in political negotiations and uh, the concepts of yeah speakers of the dead in, in Haraway's work and uh, speakers of the living as the Zoab uh, method calls them. Uh, these will yeah come into play later as we discuss uh, the possibilities of parliament of things like interventions uh, in Slovenia or Krater specifically. And so to, as mentioned, yeah, uh, change things, we need to change our ideas about change itself. Uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, but uh, yeah, on, on a first note, uh, I thought here it would be uh, sensible to just reflect a little bit on uh, the notion of the urban here as yeah i've slightly adjusted the title of this presentation including yeah urban or urban uh, transformations which in itself again is a mouthful but uh, i think this is just one way of of emphasizing both the specificity of of the urban uh, as a site yeah of political encounter interruption and experimentation today and what urban being in common really means, but the R aspect as well uh, kind of speaks to that uh, urban and rural divide also sometimes, yeah, calcifies in, in yeah, urban planning imaginaries and so forth. So it's uh, sometimes difficult to, to think uh, through these as, think through these together, but for example, uh, a scholar, uh, late scholar uh, Silke Helfrich, um, who's done yeah amazing writing on the commons. Uh, for example, here imagines a world uh, or uh, urban commons in 2040. And yeah, highly recommend you check that out. But to go back to this, um, yeah. Uh, transition design framework and the kind of theory of change aspect of it. Um, of course, uh, which theories we we hold in ourselves towards yeah, uh, social 
and institutional change matter a lot uh, in terms of uh, what kinds of designs we put out there for what purposes. And so it's maybe um, on point here to just very briefly show that, uh, yeah, theories of change in itself is a, yeah, has been thought through quite a bit uh, through, yeah, many different disciplines and interdisciplinary and, and, and broader, yeah, orientations. And these are just uh, some examples. Um, and yeah, each have their own emphases, their own yeah, ways of knowing, if you will, that, yeah, of course, it's also about academic production and we can also discuss yeah the neoliberal university and so forth and and how a lot of these theories things uh, connect with policy in ways that that mean yeah may not exactly be critical of the status quo and so forth so it's uh, useful to to see and to read up on and and uh, compare and relate to your own understanding i think of change and there are many layers to it and and towards the end of the presentation uh, yeah or in a couple of next slides we will focus more on institutional change like uh, even considering is is yeah change at the level of state possible and how that might happen but we will also consider yeah how speculative fiction uh, could play a part in prefiguring or or creating the grounds for the worlds that we would like to see um, but this is kind of a general um and i think useful yeah example of a framework for for thinking about change and one is this ruptural or radical change that we sometimes yeah uh, envision um, which might be in many cases implausible, but ruptures in certain institutions may be needed to open up possibilities for other kinds of, of transformations. Well, on the same side, interstitial, which is, I think, a lot of what we've been discussing here around Krater and its yeah, alliances between different organizations uh, in Slovenia, but also broader, um, and how that might, yeah, build contra power and how that might yeah play out with state institutions um, and the last uh, symbiotic in this formulation by eric colin wright um, in his really utopious book um, is working with essentially institutions or using them to solve problems in ways that open up space for for a transformation of those institutions uh, in the social democratic tradition so these are not necessarily mutually exclusive but uh, we do need to yeah uh, acknowledge that uh, change can happen in many ways it's often a very uh, very yeah site specific situated thing it also depends on the level the scale of intervention that that you kind of zoning in as required uh, so I'm hoping, yeah, that these uh, can help uh, with your designs. And so just to touch upon uh, the green state and some possibilities here, so, uh, like going through the kind of interstitial uh, strategy of change, right, where we have this, let's say, prefigurative movement of, of small alternatives networking among each other, um, let's say that they are creating a, a, a good associative environment to create um, uh, special forms of representing minorities and this could be non-humans but also keeping in mind all the other others uh, throughout history and uh, we we might consider uh, you know realistically how might it be possible to use the kind of uh, administrative power of the state to create conditions where uh, different social actors could be prepared uh, to listen to and um, the you know ecological struggles um, of yeah from different perspectives uh, for example to to get them to appear in public hearings and so forth um, 
so we could understand the state, the economy, civil society as as kinds of elements that that restrict each other, but there's a kind of play going on between them, yes. And one of the core arguments that uh, Eckersley makes here, makes here in, in her book, Green State, uh, on the subject is that expanding the politics of recognition uh, to to non-human agents is is key if uh, we should transcend this instrumental position to to the non-human world uh, which is characteristic of liberalism or more technocratic uh, yeah variations on uh, so-called sustainable development or ecological modernization uh, so, yeah, we should be actively, I suppose, thinking that uh, both through through our yeah visible and non-visible like activities here, that uh, how are we contributing to this bigger picture and this bigger uh, yeah uh, theories and pathways of change. <laughs> And so speculative design fiction um, is offered yeah, as, as one tool to uh, create the conditions for, for ruptures, let's say. In, in some ways, it, it might be a liberating practice to kind of uh, think away uh, real world restrictions and think through what yeah, post-human worlds, economies, more than human economies could look like yeah, in several years, in several decades, in a hundred years, but also this being an exercise at the same time for for changing, uh, yeah, mindsets, postures of of yeah readers and otherwise engagers. It's of course not only a literary genre that's uh, becoming well more and more popular, but a whole intersectional move, movement involving art and, and activists and so forth. So, yeah, we come to the notion of a parliament of things. Uh, again, the, this literary notion of, of uh, yeah, non-human representation in political negotiations. Uh, there's been a lot written up on this, also lots of critiques. I wouldn't go into too much detail here, but uh, when most people first hear about the notion, they, they picture something, I suppose, like like this, yeah. So, uh, yeah, animals one one to one, essentially representing uh, themselves. It's somewhat of a uh, comic picture actually taken completely out of context from from a commercial for how uh, politicians bicker amongst themselves uh, but we could could appropriate for this just as a small waypoint to think about yeah non-human politics these are some real world examples of of yeah a parliament of things uh, process in place uh, this is yeah a photo from a recent installation um, in the Netherlands, uh, which, as you see, is somewhat similar actually to to the picture we just saw in terms of uh, groups uh, representing different species. Although, unless these are visitors, of course, in a like uh, engagement, uh, but. Uh, uh, and and this is another example, a uh, recent example from. Taiwan, uh, where a uh, exhibition co-curated also by uh, Bruno Latour involved a theater of negotiation on a similar principle. And and here is the uh, yeah Parliament of Things initiative and uh, their kind of initiatives, uh, the North uh, Embassy of the North Sea. Uh, and this methodology again is uh, similar to the Zoab methodology in that um, there's a period of listening to the sea. So really knowing the sea's con con non-human constituency and all the relations that are found therein and also to the human systems, right? 
and also that the human here is not like this uh yeah unanimous category and that responsibility for for environmental yeah collapse is uh, yeah relegated to all humans in general but it's the specific histories the, the playouts of power etc that have led to this and then of course should seek responsibility there um but but that said uh, yes this is another example um of where uh, a kind of a assimilation of a political process could take place um, but i would note that um, this is not in some ways meant uh, to be a, a stand-in for politics uh, in some ways it's it's more of a, a public kind a way to engage the public and also you know, decision makers in a new way um, the actual you know parliament of things or however uh, we would conceptualize and name it which yeah take on uh, yeah a much more extensive at, at the same time form as as embodied yeah new embodied like social and cultural practices but also new ways of doing science uh, yeah emphasizing also uh, citizen science and post-normal science uh, in those areas And so, yeah, this is, this is an example of what uh, one engagement like this could look like. This is again in the Netherlands. Um, but to think through, yeah, to conclude, like what, what would um, change mean uh, in the context of China? Um, so as mentioned, uh, we have, uh, and also Klaus showed a very good uh, overview. Uh, maybe our friends, uh, yeah, Danica and Gaia can also like uh, chip in in a conversation here. But uh, there's yeah many organizations in Slovenia that uh, relate to different aspects of yeah let's say the problematique uh, as as described here, um, and also you know. Uh, they have identified each other and know about each other and constitute this kind of uh, network of actors on one side and again this whole uh, translocal dimension of it uh, again another level to yeah it's uh, it's uh, creating the conditions for change but on the other hand of course we have these hegemonic institutions of the state the market economy and the judicial system that have yeah many many ways of, of reproducing themselves uh including under different names and so forth um so that yeah the, for our strategies to be effective yeah we need to be thinking both at, at the different theories we have in mind the different levels of intervention again uh, we could you know think of designs that go out, all out in exploring what what a post-human economy in action would look like in a specific city in Slovenia um, to you know uh, various practices of, of imagining what practices of, of speakers of living and for the dead uh, could look like you know in one year in five years in 30 years and how the science infrastructure behind that involves and 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 yeah it's, it's reconceptualized in a way and just to mention here that yeah speakers of the living uh, is is one and speakers of the dead is another so another important aspect because as such we're living through or the beginnings of a sixth extinction with yeah many species uh, yeah dying off very silently especially here in the global north uh, we do not essentially have any um, practices that could enable us to uh, really deal with or mourn uh, these losses and at the same time those being uh, you know a way for us to to uh, to build a relational politics that can, you know, save as much as can be saved, including 
all the voices that, that should be included. Mm. So to conclude, yeah, we can envision uh, change happening in many ways. And uh, yeah, we can conceptualize governance when we talk about uh, these yeah, multi-species initiatives at many layers. One is, of course, the, the governance as a kind of experimental process that happens on site and the kind of sensing who are you know the actors, the stakeholders here um, to uh, yeah, different levels of intervention, like uh, what 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 do these actual alternative institutions look like? Um, and that being, yeah, creating conditions for their realization. So I would uh, conclude here, I suppose, and open for yeah, discussions at this point. Thank you, Rock, so much for your wonderful um, talk. And um, I would all like to first invite all our listeners, if you have any questions for Rock, please post them in the chat box below and we're happy to read them for you. Um, so while we were listening, um, I had this um, question kind of popping out. If you could maybe... Um, try to think with me somehow Ljubljana as um, this is the capital that uh, also um, yeah where me and Danica and also you lived um, and it's also the place where Krater is situated somehow was awarded the green capital of Europe a few years ago so kind of it has already a renomee of being um, quite progressive in this agenda of ecology and um, let's say and transformations towards yeah a sustainable city a sustainable city so i would be curious to understand somehow how would you be breaking out down this idea of the green capital and yeah i don't know maybe having um a commentary on like what would be another way to move forward yeah, thanks so much uh, for that question yeah, on, on the one hand, uh, as said during the presentation, where yeah we see a lot of greenwashing, let's say, happening around, and in some ways you could call these yeah green capital awards as, as one way, right? Like, hey, we're doing it, the the transition, right? We're here already, everyone, hurrah, right? But uh, the the actual politics behind this is uh, yeah quite different. Um, I mean, you know, we could also approach it from the question of how has, you know, national and, and municipal authorities specifically regarded urban commons and, uh, you know, for example, like the Krater site or other, you know, community gardens or, or other things that could be considered urban commons. Um, and well, the track record of the municipality of Ljubljana, I guess, is not that great when it comes to, you know, certain places like this. Uh, but you know, uh, and that might be in contrast to to uh, Deborah when she was you know mentioning the active collaboration with local authorities. Uh, but I would think you know there's always some public administrators who who are um, who are actually on board, not not even knowing sometimes that they are. Uh, a lot of times, you know, this requires active uh, field work, even you know lobbying in some ways to to uh, get to some of these people um to, to but it it very much depends on what what kind of yeah environment you're dealing with and what those types of actors can do you know with you or within the institutions um so but but at the same time there is of course this notion i think in slovenia present you know that there's lots of forest people are in some ways connected to nature, right? But it, it's all very like generally defined and, and no one, uh, yeah, really not sure how, how we can leverage that, right? Um, I think we also, especially in the younger generation, I think are somewhat, yeah, been uh, 
taken away from from history in some aspect and the possibilities of yeah revitalizing some uh, concepts that, that are present or were present in Slovenia like either relatively yeah not too long ago or you know uh, very long ago um, but um, yeah it's, it's a well those are some entry points uh, I guess there's no uh, real real answer to it but um, yeah I would like to see that uh, green capital awards like the, the the parameters to to define such a city that they would yeah include uh, non-human uh, concerns it might be useful to create even our own kind of sets of parameters by which we could judge uh, our in different cities rather than yeah use those that that are developed by yeah people who would like to sell uh green right But I'm thinking like, because Slovenian language tends to be so deprived of all of those expressions um, that, for example, you were mentioning, or some sort of historical expressions that might be kind of reconsidered, reconsidered to um, to kind of be um, introduced again into our vocabulary. So it seems like we <laughs> are somehow also lacking the language to speak about these new phenomena that you were. Um, that you were mentioning, so this could be also one thing that the open call could uh, look at as well. Um, that's yeah, the, there are like yeah notions like skupnina and gmaina and things like these. Uh, there's an article floating around with some yeah thinking through uh, historically uh, the uses of these terms, and that's probably a good yeah resource to to think how we can leverage that. But at the same time, we could say that degrowth, like Odrast, um, has somewhat entered the public sphere through, yeah, no small effort by various, yeah, activists embedded in different uh, spheres, um, and that it could present a leverage point. But then again, uh, degrowth has had a way of shooting itself in the foot when you mention it as degrowth, uh, because, yeah, uh, it, there is an active discussion and probably since the movement has been around for like you know many years uh, like it's probably very clear that yeah it's not maybe the optimal strategy to call it degrowth but something else like well-being economies etc but it's also like this is it, it's the content really that matters and the strategy although the, the right signifier let's say can can help um, as it was, yeah, originally proposed in, in the context of France. I was thinking when you showed this example of the stock exchange, the artist named uh, this program Stock Exchange. I was thinking, is this like, maybe it should have a different name, you know, because he really made the reference to, to the thing which is not good, I don't know. I'll to explain differently, but what do you think about this? Um, yeah, um, okay. so yeah, that was... Well, we are talking about alternative way of understanding or just representation, how to make um, this problem visible to as many people as possible, and then you're using the name stock exchange for it. And also not only the name, but the graphics and everything. You know? Yeah, I think it's, it's a plain... Uh, an example of trying to subvert it, yeah, subvert the stock exchange by naming it as, as such, right? Uh, so it, it's not so that the artists would think that it's a good idea to put non-humans on the market as it exists, but it's more like, yeah, to make this point that, well, we're already in, in a more than human economy. It's just a lot of these, you know, others are considered externalities. And, and this kind of makes you aware that, you know, anything you take out that are repercussions that reverberate in ways that we don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, that's the good point if we can subversively use these terms. Yeah, so there's like a strategy of subversion through these kinds of things, but, you know, you could also depict radical alternatives and that's, you know, another 
form or layer of intervention. And ideally, you know, you have many of these different ones acting together, right? As 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 a as a strong pressure, yeah. Uh, but also as a you know uh, door half open for any you know. Uh, players w with power also who are you know willing to help but it's it's yeah a very tricky negotiation and you know even social movements are, are um, many times not agreeing among each other of what to do precisely because there are so many theories of change in play uh, right um, and also so many discourses so I think just naming that in itself and reflecting on it can be a big help for communities and also see how, how they can yeah connect up further exert more influence in creative ways yeah. we have one comment from Kudu culture and one question and the question was going uh, for have you all considered compiling a glossary of working evolving terms and to answer that um, together with Danit and also Rook um, and class and based on classes and the lecture we're preparing like a short um let's say um study material for the for the mentorship sessions so we will include a short glossary um of what was of what was explaining today and also mm. um, I could also mention here that uh, there's a, a lovely book out there called the post-human glossary and I believe uh, a, a new version of it just came out as well. Um, and that is kind of the intent really to map out the, the intersectionality of, of this whole uh, field and struggle, vision, movement, discourse. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and the other more of a common the culture was um, um, so thank you for making these distinctions. I'm um, uncomfortable using post-human language because it verges on eugenic and dismisses the fact that many human animals, past and present, are indeed aligned with and equally value all species without placing humans above others. It seems more effective and accurate to use post-humanism uh, versus post-human. So if you have any... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, well, Rossi Bradotti is probably the resource for here, but in terms of my two cents, it, it might, you know, well be that post-humanism should be reserved to, to you know, or theoretical thinking, etc. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a notion, concept, it's a heuristic, right? It's a way of, of knowing or thinking uh, something. So like, um, and the post also, you know, we could problematize it like, um, uh, because a lot of times a post something means that we just kind of skip ahead a whole social process that we need to undergo and we're like already there, right? But that's, that's not true. We, you know, we have a lot of work to do. And, and Rossi Berdotti also mentioned this, for example, in, the, in her books, uh, Post-Human Feminism, for example. So it's, um you know the it's the debate is is open whether you know what we should call it or not and you know it's, it's multi-species perspective post-human although it's useful to disambiguate you know post-human and, and more than human uh, and non-human and, and things like this um but uh, generally i think it's more like a, yeah it's it's an alive practice that's ongoing and it will be known uh, by many names yeah, in different circumstances maybe with one more question um so we have a few minutes more to think about this complex terms and um ask anything else as my question will go you mentioned that that we should work on opening up ways to transform institutions. I think one one way is what they're doing here now. They're actually opening up school or the notion of school by organizing this program. Uh, but <laughs> the really hard question is how to open this such a colossal institution, which is a justice system, because this is what we are addressing here. Um, I think class gave us some insights on it. 
um, but I don't know because we are not neither of us is a lawyer. We don't have in-depth understanding of, of justice or how I don't know um, the processes are like. So, what are, what are your notions on? I don't know what what are you saying because you joined the program and I'm sure you have some I don't know. Mm, I don't, know, I don't even know how to name it, but yeah, this is my question: How to, to transform this justice system through mm -hmm. this program, or I don't know. This is really ambitious. Yeah, yeah. what kind of possible interventions you might have? Yeah, it's 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 a very like ambitious task. Yeah, framed as such, like uh, of course we can see it like in yeah, like with humility and as a small step in a in a probably what is going to be a longer than we would like change process as it usually is. Um, but um, yeah, and, and such a, you know, institution with power where you're not even sure where to to start. But I think the, the first one is, yeah, look, I mean, it's already like a beginning that, you know, these, these groups are, you know, inter, you know, interdisciplinary, some also uh, hopefully, with with uh, lawyering skills, I know in Slovenia uh, there has been, you know, at the law department, uh, yeah, some interest, in, in quite a few people, I think, yeah, mobilized around like you know, environmental law. Um, although, yeah, these these things are very much lacking in Slovenia as well, and that's part of the problem. We we don't have institutionalized, you know, education. Uh, uh, programs like interdisciplinary education programs for environment or if we do that they, they are very scarce um, and yeah mostly up to yeah motivations of, of the uh, lecturers or, or the students themselves if, if they do something in, in these directions um, so that's also not going for us right but but here we're reaching out to yeah also um, yeah, communities outside Slovenia to think this uh, with us and, and with this also, I think, sparking an interest uh, here. Uh, I think there's more and more events also uh, also in art. I think more and more uh, interventions we see in Slovenia. Um, yeah, through this, th there's also going to be an interesting uh, conference, an art and, and nature conference uh, in November. Um, yeah, and also a political ecology summer school uh, during the summer, um, and yeah, we're hoping to yeah among among these to to create connections. Um, and I think yeah, should be thinking all sorts. As, as said before, you can uh, it could be in the form of a design of a methodology similar to to the ZOOP or the the Parliament of Things, like the you know. The, the sensing or, or or listening to what's out there and, and partially you know this has been done for Kratzer probably not for a lot of sites um, and a lot of sites don't really have custodians probably as as you uh, as Straina and, and so forth and no one to speak speak for them right uh, and also to speak to, to the broader uh, problematic right we're all limited in our knowledge capacities and a lot of times this yeah is relegated to volunteer and activist work and so forth um uh, so yeah it's it's either you know methods that can uh, kind of attract uh, or you know get civil society to engage with this but also policy makers and as said like uh, you know, researchers and of all sorts and so forth and change movements and connect, connecting them those those through this uh, yeah visions of possibilities both in near and far futures can help in expanding uh, uh, yeah notions of the possible um, and sometimes you know this exercises in radical imagination uh, done collectively also can be quite you know an empowering or emancipatory activity 
in some ways and it also can inform right where when you can let go of some obstacles in real world to think about alternatives then those in turn can inform some of, some of your strategies uh, to make you know help make them real um, so yeah it's, it's going to be a combination of all those through design um, as I said either subversion of yeah market forms to whole alternative forms visualized or experienceable in the form of like you know experiential scenarios people can interact with or, or even interactive games or things of that sort um but of course you know life on earth it's not a game it's a serious matter in, in many ways and yeah in global north i think a lot of times we you know, think of playful interactions and, and stuff like this as ways forward. And actually there's precedence, you know, to think through, I mean, thinking just how far we are in the global north from a kind of, you know, uh, consciousness beyond this, you know, uh, human non human divide and, and uh, cosmologies, epistemologies elsewhere, ways of knowing. Um, but yeah, I think to 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 map and to systematize these these options and these levers um, would be yeah a, a key contribution probably of this project uh, that can be yeah the stepping stone like a toolkit of sorts right that is open ended um, and will be yeah added to as we go yeah we hope so. Yeah, this is why we would really like to stress out again for everyone who is listening right now or listening a bit later that you're, as we already mentioned, really encouraged to gather all together. Um, so permaculture professionals, designers, landscape architects, architects, uh, social scientists, um, and many other similar, similar profiles, lawyers, who of course, um, can all together contribute to these questions that we're asking right now because we are yeah, really believe that we cannot do it alone and that we need um, sort of trust. Um, yeah, base of knowledge that is coming from you to understand how we can tackle this, but also other problems that are in front of us or situations. And then there was another comment coming from Barkitza. Uh, and she's thanking for the thought-provoking uh, lecture and discussion. I like the idea of making our uh, own parameters for grading interventions in space. Maybe we need a way to do it uh, on a Slovenian scale. Um, so this is, again, another idea that might be further um, yeah, um, explored during the open call. So we encourage you, Barkica, to apply. Uh, and there is another Kudzu culture um, comment. Art and fiction are so important to show possibilities of regenerative futures that are not this topic. Uh, what we think and say we become. Thank you for that. Um, yes, have... I, I think that we could conclude and that note if there is no further questions. Um, yes, if there is no further questions, I think um, we'll close um, this uh, wonderful Rook Talks uh, talk with inviting you um, to again revisit the videos uh, if you like this one. All the videos that have been produced uh, through the school are available on Trana's YouTube channel and also on the Crater website. Um, so you're welcome to. Yeah, to revisit and share. Um, and also, if you have any other questions regarding the, the open call, um, you can write to us uh, on Trina email at info at trina.com. Um, and yes, again, the results of the, um, the project will be part of the uh, satellite program of the this year's biennial of design. Uh, in, happening in Ljubljana in the Museum of Architecture and Design. And this year's topic is Super Vernaculars, Design for a Regenerative, regenerative Future. Um, the exhibition will open on 26th of May. Also, the Crater community 
the Creative Z Crater will be called contributing with another project called Forbidden Vernaculars, exploring the um, construction materials from crater site as an alternative to, um, um, to other industrial materials. So you're also welcome to join us on 26th of May at the opening. Um, and yes, thank you for again from our side. It was really a pleasure um, to host this, to host you, and hope, hope to see you in May. Yes, there are just three days left, so go there and apply <laughs> to, to join us. Um, and uh, yeah, to... So we can celebrate the Earth, yes. <laughs> the Earth Day together. And go deeper into all these complex um, questions and uh, thoughts that we heard from our lecturers. So I think that we could conclude now. Yes, goodbye. <laughs> Enjoy. Bye. Thank you.